Section twenty four of The Seen and the Unseen by Richard Marsh. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sonia. Eleven. The Houseboat. Chapter one. I am sure of it. Inglis laid down his knife and fork. He stared round and round the small apartment in a manner which was distinctly strange. My wife caught him up. She laid down her knife and fork. You sure of what? Inglis seemed disturbed. He appeared unwilling to give a direct answer. Perhaps, after all, it's only a coincidence. But Violet insisted. What is a coincidence? Inglis addressed himself to me. The fact is, Millen, directly I came on board, I thought I had seen this boat before. But I thought you had said that you had never heard of the water lily. Nor have I. The truth is that when I knew it, it wasn't the water lily. I don't understand. They must have changed the name. Unless I am very much mistaken, this, this used to be the sylph. The sylph? You don't mean to say that you have never heard of the sylph? Inglis asked his question in a tone of voice which was peculiar. My dear fellow, I am not a river in authority. I am not acquainted with every houseboat between Richmond and Oxford. It was only at your special recommendation that I took the water lily. <laughs> Excuse me, Millen. I advise the houseboat. I didn't specify the water lily. But, asked my wife, what was the matter with the sylph that she should so mysteriously have become the water lily? Inglis fenced with this question in a manner which seemed to suggest a state of mental confusion. Of course, Millen, I know that that sort of thing would not have the slightest influence on you. It is only people of a very different sort who would allow it to have any effect on them. Then, after all, I may be wrong. And in any case, I don't see that it matters. Mr. Inglis, are you suggesting that the sylph was haunted? Haunted? Inglis started. I never dropped a hint about its being haunted. So far as I remember, I never heard a word of anything of the kind. Violet placed her knife and fork together on her plate. She folded her hands upon her lap. Mr. Inglis, there is a mystery. Will you this mystery unfold? Didn't you really ever hear about the sylph? Two years ago? Two years ago we were out of England. Oh, so you were. Perhaps that explains it. You understand, this mayn't be the sylph. I may be wrong, though I don't think I am. Inglis glanced uncomfortably at the chair on which he was sitting. Why, I believe this is the very chair on which I sat. I remember noticing what a queer shape it was. It was rather an odd-shaped chair. For that matter, all the things on board were odd. Then have you been on board this boat before? Yes, Inglis positively shuddered. I was, once, if it is the sylph, that is. He thrust his hands into his trouser pockets. He leaned back in his chair. A curious look came into his face. It is the sylph, I'll swear to it. It all comes back to me. What an extraordinary coincidence. One might almost think there was something supernatural in the thing. His manner fairly roused me. I wish you would stop speaking in riddles and tell us what you are driving at. He became preternaturally solemn. Millen, I'm afraid I have made rather an ass of myself. I ought to have held my tongue. But the coincidence is such a strange one that it took me unawares, and since I have said so much, I suppose I may as well say more. After dinner I will tell you all there is to tell. I don't think it's a story which Mrs. Millen would like to listen to. Violet's face was a study. I don't understand you, Mr. Inglis, because you are quite well aware it is a principle of mine that what is good for a husband to hear is good for a wife. Come, don't be silly. Let us hear what the fuss is about. I dare say it's about nothing, after all. You think so? 
well mrs millen you shall hear he carefully wiped his moustache he began two years ago there was a houseboat on the river called the sylph it belonged to a man named hambro he lent it to a lady and a gentleman she was rather a pretty woman with a lot of fluffy golden hair he was a quiet unassuming looking man who looked as though he had something to do with horses i made their acquaintance on the river one evening he asked me on board to dine i sat as i believe on this very chair at this very table three days afterwards they disappeared well i asked inglis had paused so far as i know he has never been seen or heard of since and the lady some of us were getting up a picnic we wanted them to come with us we couldn't quite make out their sudden disappearance so two days after we had missed them i and another man tried to rout them out i looked through the window i saw something lying on the floor jarvis i whispered i believe that mrs bush is lying on the floor dead drunk she can't have been drunk two days he said he came to my side why she's in her nightdress this is very queer inglis i wonder if the door is locked it wasn't we opened it and went inside inglis emptied his glass of wine the woman we had known as mrs bush lay in her nightdress dead upon the floor she had been stabbed to the heart she was lying just about where mrs millen is sitting now mr inglis violet rose suddenly there is reason to believe that from one point of view the woman was no better than she ought to have been that is the story but i confess it was not at all the story i had expected it was going to be i did not altogether like it who killed her that is the question there was no direct evidence to show no weapon was discovered the man we had known as bush had vanished as it seemed off the face of the earth he had not left so much as a pocket handkerchief behind him everything both of his and hers had gone it turned out that nobody knew anything at all about him they had no servant what meals they had on board were sent in from the hotel hambro had advertised the sylph bush had replied to the advertisement he had paid the rent in advance and hambro had asked no questions and what became of the sylph she also vanished she had become a little too notorious one doesn't fancy living on board a houseboat on which a murder has been committed one is at too close quarters i suppose hambro sold her for what he could get and the purchaser painted her and rechristened her the water lily but are you sure this is the sylph as sure as i am sitting here it is impossible that i could be mistaken i still seem to see that woman lying dead just about where mrs millen is standing now mr inglis violet was standing up she moved away towards me inglis left soon afterwards he did not seem to care to stop he had scarcely eaten any dinner in fact that was the case with all of us mason had exerted herself to prepare a decent meal in her cramped little kitchen and we had been so ungrateful as not even to reach the end of her bill of fare when inglis had gone she appeared in her bonnet and cloak we supposed that very naturally she had taken umbrage if you please ma'am i'm going mason what do you mean i couldn't think of stopping in no place in which murder was committed least of all a houseboat not to mention that last night i heard ghosts if ever any one heard them yet mason don't be absurd i thought you had more sense all i can say is ma'am that last night as i lay awake listening to the splashing of the water all at once i heard in here the sound of quarrelling i couldn't make it out i thought that you and the master was having words yet it didn't sound like your voices besides you went on awful still i didn't like to say nothing because it might have been and it wasn't my place to say that i had heard but now i know that it was ghosts she went she was not to be persuaded to stay any more than inglis she did not even stay to clear the table i have seldom seen a woman in a greater hurry 
as for wages there was not a hint of them staid elderly self-possessed female though she was she seemed to be in a perfect panic of fear nothing would satisfy her but that she should with the greatest possible expedition shake from her feet the dust of the water-lily when we were quit of her i looked at violet and violet looked at me i laughed i will not go so far as to say that i laughed genially still i laughed <laughs> we seem to be in for a pleasant river holiday eric let us go outside we went on deck the sun had already set there was no moon but there was a cloudless sky the air was languorous and heavy boats were stealing over the waters some one in the distance was playing a banjo accompaniment while a clear girlish voice was singing the garden of sleep the other houseboats were radiant with chinese lanterns the water lily alone was still in shadow we drew our deck chairs close together violet's hand stole into mine eric do you know that last night i too heard voices you i laughed again violet i couldn't make it out at all i was just going to wake you when they were still you were dreaming child inglis story confound him and his story has recalled your dream to mind i hope you don't wish to follow mason's example and make a bolt of it i have paid pretty stiffly for the honour of being the water lily tenant for a month not to mention the fact of disarranging all our plans violet paused before she answered no i don't think i want as you say to make a bolt of it indeed she nestled closer to my side it is rather the other way i should like to see it through i have sometimes thought that i should like to be with someone i can trust in a situation such as this perhaps we may be able to fathom the mystery who knows this tickled me i thought you had done with romance with one sort of romance i hope i shall never have done she pressed my hand she looked up archly into my face i knew it although we were in shadow with another sort of romance i may be only just beginning i have never yet had dealings with a ghost end of section 24《Eleven》The Houseboat, Chapter Two. At first, I could not make out what it was that had roused me. Then I felt Violet's hand steal into mine. Her voice whispered in my ear, "Eric." I turned over towards her on the pillow. "Be still. They're here." i did as she bade me i was still i heard no sound but the lazy rippling of the river who's here i asked when as i deemed i had been silent long enough Shh. i felt her finger pressed against my lips i was still again the silence was broken in rather a peculiar manner i don't think you quite understand me the words were spoken in a man's voice as it seemed to me close behind my back i was so startled by the unexpected presence of a third person that i made as if to spring up in bed my wife caught me by the arm before i could remonstrate or shake off her grasp a woman's laughter rang through the little cabin it was too metallic to be agreeable and the woman's voice replied i understand you well enough don't you make any error there was a momentary pause you don't understand me fool the first four words were spoken with a deliberation which meant volumes while the final epithet came with a sudden malignant ferocity which took me aback the speaker whoever he might be meant mischief i sprang up and out of bed what are you doing here i cried I addressed the inquiry apparently to the vacant air. The moonlight flooded the little cabin. It showed clearly enough that it was empty. My wife sat up in bed. Now, she observed, you've done it. Done what? Who was that speaking? The voices. 
the voices what voices i'll voice them where the dickens have they gone i moved towards the cabin door with the intention of pursuing my inquiries further violet's voice arrested me it is no use your going to look for them they will not be found by searching the speakers were mr and mrs bush mr and mrs bush violet's voice dropped to an awful whisper the murderer and his victim i stared at her in the moonlight inglis's pleasant little story had momentarily escaped my memory suddenly roused from a dreamless slumber i had not yet had time to recall such trivialities now it all came back in a flash violet i exclaimed have you gone mad they are the voices which i heard last night they are the voices which mason heard now you have heard them if you had kept still the mystery might have been unravelled the crime might have been reacted before our eyes or at least within sound of our ears i sat down upon the ingenious piece of furniture which did duty as a bed i seemed to have struck upon a novel face in my wife's character it was not altogether a pleasing novelty she spoke with a degree of judicial calmness which under all the circumstances i did not altogether relish violet i wish you wouldn't talk like that it makes my blood run cold why should it my dear eric i have heard you yourself say that in the presence of the seemingly mysterious our attitude should be one of passionless criticism a mysterious crime has been committed in this very chamber i shivered surely it is our duty to avail ourselves of any opportunities which may offer and which may enable us to probe it to the bottom i made no answer i examined the doors they were locked and bolted there was no sign that any one had tampered with the fastenings i returned to bed as i was arranging myself between the sheets violet whispered in my ear perhaps if we are perfectly quiet they may come back again i am not a man given to adjectives but i felt adjectival then i was about to explain in language which would not have been wanting in force that i had no desire that they should come back again when you had better give it to me the words were spoken in a woman's voice as it seemed within twelve inches of my back the voice was not that of a lady i should have said without hesitation had i heard the voice under any other circumstances that the speaker had been born within the sound of bow bells had i it was a man's voice which put the question there was something about the tone in which the speaker put it which reminded one of the line in the people's ballad it ain't exactly what he says it's the nasty way he says it the question was put in a very nasty way indeed yes my boy you had indeed yes you may say indeed but if you don't i tell you what i'll do i'll spoil you and what my dear gertie am i to understand by the mystic threat of spoiling me i'll go straight to your wife and i'll tell her everything oh you will will you there was a movement of a chair the male speaker was getting up yes i will there was a slight pause one could fancy that the speakers were facing each other one could picture the look of impudent defiance upon the woman's countenance the suggestion of coming storm upon that of the man it was the man's voice which broke the silence it is odd gertrude that you should have chosen this evening to threaten me because i myself had chosen this evening i won't say to threaten but to make a communication to you give me a match the request came from the woman with pleasure i will give you anything my dear gertrude within reason there was another pause in the silence i seemed to hear my wife holding her breath as i certainly was holding mine all at once there came a sound of scratching a flash of light it came so unexpectedly and such was the extreme tension of my nerves that with a stifled exclamation i half rose in bed my wife pressed her hand against my lips she held me down she spoke in so attenuated a whisper that it was only because all my senses were so keenly on the alert that i heard her you goose 
he's only striking a match he might have been but who she took things for granted i wanted to know the light continued flickering to and fro as a match does flicker i would have given much to know who held it or even what was its position in the room as luck had it my face was turned the other way my wife seemed to understand what was passing in my mind there is no one there she whispered no one i presumed but the match i took it for granted that was there though i did not venture to inquire i felt that i might not have such perfect control over my voice as my wife appeared to have while the light continued to flicker there came stealing into my nostrils i sniffed the thing was unmistakable the odour of tobacco the woman was lighting a cigarette i knew it was the woman because presently there came this request from the man after you with the light my dear i presume that the match was passed immediately the smell of tobacco redoubled the man had lit a cigarette as well i confess that i resented silently but still strongly the idea of two strangers whether ghosts or anybody else smoking uninvited in my cabin the match went out the cigarettes were lit the man continued speaking the communication my dear gertrude which i intended to make to you was this the time has come for us to part he paused possibly for an answer none came i need not enlarge on the reasons which necessitate our parting they exist pause again then the woman what are you going to give me one of the reasons which necessitate our parting a very strong reason as you i am sure will be the first to admit is that i have nothing left to give you so you say precisely so i say and so i mean do you mean that you are going to give me nothing i mean my dear gertrude that i have nothing to give you you have left me nothing Pah! the sound which issued from the lady's lips was expressive of the most complete contempt look here my boy you give me a hundred sovereigns or i'll spoil you pause again probably the gentleman was thinking over the lady's observation what benefit do you think you will do yourself by what you call spoiling me never mind about that i'll do it you think i don't know all about you but i do perhaps i'm not so soft as you think your wife's got some money if you haven't suppose you go back and ask her for some you've treated me badly enough i don't see why you shouldn't go and treat her the same she wouldn't make things warm for you if she knew a few things i could tell her not at all you give me a hundred sovereigns or i tell you straight i'll go right to your house and i'll tell her all oh no you won't won't i i say i will oh no you won't i say i will i've warned you that's all i'm not going to stop here talking stuff to you i'm going to bed you can go and hang yourself for all i care there was a sound an indubitable sound the sound of a pair of shoes being thrown upon the floor there were other sounds equally capable of explanation sounds which suggested i wish the printer would put it in small type that the lady was undressing undressing too with scant regard to ceremony garments were thrown off and tossed higgledy piggledy here and there they appeared to be thrown with sublime indifference upon table chairs and floor i even felt something alight upon the bed some feminine garment perhaps which although it fell by no means heavily made me conscious as it fell of the most curious sensation i had in all my life till then experienced it seemed that the lady while she unrobed continued smoking from her next words it appeared that the gentleman also smoking stood and stared at her don't stand staring at me like a gawk i'm going to turn in and i'm going to turn out not as you suggested to hang myself but to finish this cigarette upon the roof perhaps when i return you will be in a more equable frame of mind don't you flatter yourself what i say i mean a hundred sovereigns 
or i tell your wife he laughed very softly as though he was determined not to be annoyed then we heard his footsteps as he crossed the floor the door opened then closed we heard him ascend the steps then with curious distinctness his measured tramp tramp as he moved to and fro upon the roof in the cabin for a moment there was silence then the woman said with a curious faltering in her voice i'll do it i don't care what he says there was a choking in her throat he don't care for me a bit suddenly she flung herself upon her knees beside the bed she pillowed her head and arms upon the coverlet i lay near the outer edge of the bed which was a small one by the way as i lay i felt the pressure of her limbs my sensations as i did i am unable to describe after a momentary interval there came the sound of sobbing i could feel the woman quivering with the strength of her emotion violet and i were speechless i do not think that for the instant we could have spoken even had we tried the woman's presence was so evident her grief so real as she wept disjointed words came from her i've given everything for him if he only cared for me if he only did all at once with a rapid movement she sprang up the removal of the pressure was altogether unmistakable i was conscious of her resting her hands upon the coverlet to assist her to her feet i felt the little jerk then the withdrawal of the hands she choked back her sobs when she had gained her feet her tone was changed what a fool i am to make a fuss he don't care for me not that we heard her snap her fingers in the air he never did us women are always fools we're all the same i'll go to bed violet clutched my arm she whispered in that attenuated fashion she seemed to have caught the trick of she is getting into bed we must get out it certainly was a fact someone was getting into bed the bedclothes were moved not our bedclothes but some phantom coverings we heard them rustle we were conscious of a current of air across our faces as someone caught them open and then then someone stepped upon the bed let's get out gasped violet end of section twenty five Section twenty six of The Seen and the Unseen by Richard Marsh. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sonia. Eleven. The Houseboat. Chapter three. She moved away from me. She squeezed herself against the side of the cabin. She withdrew her limbs from between the sheets. As for me, the person who had stepped upon the bed had actually stepped upon me, and that without seeming at all conscious of my presence someone sat down plump upon the sheet beside me that was enough i took advantage of my lying on the edge of the bed to slip out upon the floor i might possess an unsuspected capacity for undergoing strange experiences but i drew the line at sleeping with a ghost the moonlight streamed across the room as i stood in something very like a state of nature on the floor i could clearly see violet cowering on the further side of the bed I could distinguish all her features but when i looked upon the bed itself there was nothing there the moon's rays fell upon the pillow they revealed its snowy whiteness there seemed nothing else it could reveal it was untenanted and yet if one looked closely at it it seemed to be indented just as it might have been indented had a human head been lying there but about one thing there could be no mistake whatever my ears did not play me false i heard it too distinctly the sound made by a person who settles himself between the sheets and then the measured respiration of one who composes himself to slumber i remained there silent on her hands and knees violet crept towards the foot of the bed when she had gained the floor she stole on tiptoe to my side i did not dare to step across her i felt her as she nestled to me give me a little shiver i could not do it can you see her 
what a fool i am as violet asked her question there came this observation from the person in the bed whom by the way i could not see there was a long-drawn sigh oh, what fools all we women are what fools there was a sincerity of bitterness about the tone which coming as it did from an unseen speaker one so near and yet so far had on one a most uncomfortable effect violet pressed closer to my side the woman in the bed turned over overhead there still continued the measured tramp tramping of the man we were conscious in some subtle way that the woman lay listening to the footsteps they spoke more audibly to her ears even than to ours ollie ollie she repeated the name softly to herself with a degree of tenderness which was in startling contrast to her previous bitterness i wish you would come to bed she was silent there was only the sound of her gentle breathing her bitter mood had been but transient she was falling asleep with words of tenderness upon her lips above the footsteps ceased all was still there was not even the murmur of the waters the wife and i side by side stood looking down upon what seemed an empty bed she is asleep said violet it seemed to me she was although i could not see her it seemed to me she was i could hear her breathing as softly as a child violet continued whispering how strange eric what can it mean i muttered a reply a problem for the psychical research society it seems just like a dream i wish it were a dream Shh! there is someone coming down the stairs there was at least if we could trust our ears there was apparently the man above had had enough of solitude we heard him move across the roof then pause just by the steps then descend them one by one it seemed to us that in this step there was something stealthy that he was endeavouring not to arouse attention to make as little noise as possible half way down he paused at the foot he paused again he's listening outside the door it almost seemed that he was we stood and listened too let's get away from the bed my wife drew me with her at the opposite end of the cabin was a sort of little alcove which was screened by a curtain and behind which were hung one or two of our garments which we were not actually using violet drew me within the shadow of this alcove i say drew me because offering no resistance i allowed myself to be completely passive in her hands the alcove was not large enough to hold us still the curtain acted as a partial screen the silence endured for some moments then we heard without a hand softly turning the handle of the door while i was wondering whether after all i was not the victim of an attack of indigestion or whether i was about to witness an attempt at effecting a burglarious entry into a houseboat a strange thing happened the strangest thing that had happened yet as i have already mentioned the moon's rays flooded the cabin this was owing to the fact that a long narrow casement which ran round the walls near the roof of the cabin had been left open for the sake of admitting air and ventilation but save for the moonbeams the cabin was unlighted when however we heard the handle being softly turned a singular change occurred it was like the transformation scene in a theatre the whole place all at once was brilliantly illuminated the moonbeams disappeared instead a large swinging lamp was hanging from the centre of the cabin so strong was the light which it shed around that our eyes were dazzled it was not our lamp we used small hand lamps which stood upon the table by its glare we saw that the whole cabin was changed for an instant we failed to clearly realize in what the change consisted then we understood it was a question of decoration the contents of the cabin for the most part were the same though they looked newer and the positions of the various articles were altered but the panels of the cabin of the water lily were painted blue and white the panels of this cabin were colored chocolate and gold eric it's the sylph the suggestion conveyed by my wife's whispered words even as she spoke occurred to me i understood where for inglis had lain the difficulty of recognition the two cabins were the same and yet they were not 
it was just as though someone had endeavoured without spending much cash to render one as much as possible unlike the other in this cabin there were many things which were not ours in fact so far as i can see there was nothing which was ours strange articles of costume were scattered about the table was covered with a curious litter and on the ingenious article of furniture which did duty as a bed and which stood where our bed stood and which indeed seemed to be our bed there was someone sleeping as my startled eyes travelled round this amazing transformation scene at last they reached the door there they stayed mechanically i shrank back nearer to the wall i felt my wife tighten her grasp upon my hand the door was open some few inches through the aperture thus formed there peered a man he seemed to be listening it was so still that one could hear the gentle breathing of the woman sleeping in the bed apparently satisfied he opened the door sufficiently wide to admit of his entering the cabin my impression was that he could not fail to perceive us yet to all appearances he remained entirely unconscious of our neighbourhood he was a man certainly under five feet six in height he was slight in build very dark with face clean-shaven his face was long and narrow in dress and bearing he seemed a gentleman yet there was that about him which immediately reminded me of what inglis had said of the man bush he looked as though he had something to do with horses he stood for some seconds in an attitude of listening so close to me that i had only to stretch out my hand to take him by the throat i did not do it i don't know what restrained me i think more than anything it was the feeling that these things which were passing before me must be passing in a dream his face was turned away he looked intently towards the sleeping woman after he had had enough of listening he moved towards the bed his step was soft and cat-like it was absolutely noiseless glancing down i perceived that he was without boots or shoes he was in his stockinged feet i had distinctly heard the tramp tramping of a pair of shoes upon the cabin roof i had heard them descend the steps possibly he had paused outside the door to take them off when he reached the bed he stood looking down upon the sleeper he stooped over her as if the better to catch her breathing he whispered softly gertie he paused for a moment as if for an answer none came standing up he put his hand as it seemed to me into the bosom of his flannel shirt he took out a leather sheath from the sheath he drew a knife it was a long slender glittering blade quite twelve inches in length at no part was it broader than my little finger with the empty sheath in his left hand the knife behind his back in his right he again leaned over the sleeper again he softly whispered gertie again there was no answer again he stood upright turning his back towards the bed so that he looked towards us his face was not an ugly one though the expression was somewhat saturnine on it at the instant there was a peculiar look such a look as i could fancy upon the face of a jockey who toward the close of a great race settles himself in the saddle with the determination to finish well the naked blade he placed upon the table the empty sheath beside it then he moved towards us my first thought was that now at last we were discovered but something in the expression of his features told me that this was not so he approached us with an indifference which was amazing he passed so close to us that we were conscious of the slight disturbance of the air caused by his passage there was a gladstone bag on a chair within two feet of us picking it up he bore it to the table opening it out he commenced to pack it all manner of things he placed within it both masculine and feminine belongings even the garments which the sleeper had taken off and which lay scattered on the chair and on the floor even her shoes and stockings when the bag was filled he took a long brown ulster which was thrown over the back of a chair he stuffed the pockets with odds and ends when he had completed his operations the cabin was stripped of everything except the actual furniture he satisfied himself that this was so by overhauling every nook and corner in the process passing and repassing violet and me with a perfect unconcern which was more and more amazing being apparently at last clear in his mind upon that point he put on the ulster and the dark cloth cap and began to fasten the gladstone bag 
while he was doing so his back being turned to the bed without the slightest warning the woman in the bed sat up the man's movements had been noiseless he had made no sound which could have roused her possibly some sudden intuition had come to her in her sleep however that might be she all at once was wide awake she stared round the apartment with wandering eyes her glance fell on the man dressed as for a journey where are you going the words fell from her lips as unawares then some sudden conception of his purpose seemed to have flown to her brain she sprang out of bed with a bound you shan't go she screamed she rushed to him he put his hand on the table he turned to her something flashed in the lamplight it was the knife as she came he plunged it into her side right to the hilt for an instant he held her spitted on the blade he put his hand to her throat he thrust her from him with the other hand he extricated the blade he let her fall upon the floor she had uttered a sort of sigh as the weapon was being driven home beyond that she had not made a sound all was still he remained for some seconds looking down at her as she lay then he turned away we saw his face it was if possible paler than before a smile distorted his lips he stood for a moment as if listening then he glanced round the cabin as if to make sure that he was unobserved his black eyes travelled over our startled features in evident unconsciousness that we were there then he glanced at the blade in his hand as he did so he perceptibly shuddered the glittering steel was obscured with blood as he perceived that this was so he gasped he seemed to realize for the first time what it was that he had done taking an envelope from an inner pocket of his ulster he began to wipe the blood from off the blade while doing so his wandering glance fell upon the woman lying on the floor some new aspect of the recumbent figure seemed to strike him with a sudden horror he staggered backwards i thought he would have fallen he caught at the wall to help him stand caught at the wall with the hand which held the blade at that part of the cabin the wall was doubly panelled half way to the roof between the outer and the inner panel there was evidently a cavity because when in his sudden alarm he clutched at the wall the blade slipped from his relaxing grasp and fell between the panels such was his state of panic that he did not appear to perceive what had happened and at that moment a cry rang out upon the river possibly it was someone hailing the keeper of the lock ahoy the sound seemed to fill him with unreasoning terror he rushed to the table he closed the gladstone with a hurried snap he caught it up he turned to flee as he did so i stepped out of the alcove i advanced right in front of him i cannot say whether he saw me or whether he didn't but he seemed to see me he started back a look of the most awful terror came on his countenance and at that same instant the whole scene vanished i was standing in the cabin of the water lily the moon was stealing through the little narrow casement violet was creeping to my side she stole into my arms i held her to me eric she moaned for myself i am not ashamed to own that temporarily i had lost the use of my tongue when in a measure the faculty of speech returned to me was it a dream i whispered it was a vision a vision i shuddered look as i spoke she turned to look there in the moonbeams we saw a woman in her nightdress lying on the cabin floor we saw that she had golden hair it seemed to us that she was dead we saw her but a moment she was gone it must have been imagination we know that these things are not but it belonged to that order of imagination which is stranger than reality my wife looked up at me eric it is a vision which has been sent to us in order that we may expose in the light of day a crime which was hidden in the night i said nothing i felt for a box of matches on the table i lit a lamp i looked round and round the cabin holding the lamp above my head the better to assist my search it was with a feeling of the most absurd relief that i perceived that everything was unchanged that so far as i could see there was no one there but my wife and i i think violet if you don't mind i'll have some whisky 
she offered no objection she stood and watched me as i poured the stuff into a glass i am bound to admit that the spirit did me good and what i asked do you make of the performance we have just now witnessed she was still i took another drink there can be no doubt that under certain circumstances whisky is a fluid which is not to be despised have we both suddenly become insane or do you attribute it to the cucumber we ate at lunch how strange that mr inglis should have told us the story only this afternoon i wish mr inglis had kept the story to himself entirely they were the voices which i heard last night they were the voices mason heard it was all predestined i understand it now i wish that i could say the same i see it all she pressed her hands against her brow her eyes flashed fire i see why it was sent to us what it is we have to do eric we have to find the knife i began to fear from her frenzied manner that her brain must in reality be softening what knife the knife which he dropped between the panels the boat has only been repainted we know that in all essentials the sylph and the water lily are one and the same mr inglis said that the weapon which did the deed was never found no adequate search was ever made it is waiting for us where he dropped it my dear violet don't you think you had better have a little whisky it will calm you have you a hammer and a chisel what do you want them for it was here that he was standing it was here that he dropped the knife she had taken up her position against the wall at the foot of the bed frankly i did not like her manner at all it was certainly where in the latter portion of that nightmare the fellow had been standing i will wrench this panel away she rapped against the particular panel with her knuckles behind it we shall find the knife my dear violet this houseboat isn't mine we cannot destroy another man's property in that wanton fashion he will hardly accept as an adequate excuse the fact that at the time we were suffering from a severe attack of indigestion this will do she took a large carving knife out of the knife basket which was on the shelf close by her she thrust the blade between the panel and the woodwork it could scarcely have been securely fastened in a surprisingly short space of time she had forced it loose then grasping it with both her hands she hauled the panel bodily away eric it is there something was there resting on a little ledge which had checked its fall on to the floor beneath something which was covered with paint and dust and cobwebs and violet all at once grew timid you take it i dare not touch the thing it is very curious something is there and by george it is a knife it was a knife the knife which we had seen in the vision the dream the nightmare call it what you will the something which had seemed so real there was no mistaking it tarnished though it was the long slender blade which we had seen the man draw from the leather sheath stuck to it by what was afterwards shown to be coagulated blood was an envelope the envelope which we had seen the fellow take from his pocket to wipe off the crimson stain it had adhered to the blade when the knife fell the envelope fell too at least i murmured as i stared at this grim relic this is a singular coincidence the blood upon the blade had dried it required but little to cause the envelope to fall away as a matter of fact while i was still holding the weapon in my hand it fell to the floor i picked it up it was addressed in a woman's hand francis joins esq fairly streatham i at once recognized the name as that of a well-known owner of racehorses and so-called gentleman rider not the least singular part of all that singular story was that the letter inside that envelope which was afterwards opened and read by the proper authorities was from mr joints's wife it was a loving tender letter from a wife who was an invalid abroad to a husband whom she supposed was thinking of her at home mr joints was never arrested and that for this sufficient reason that when the agents of the law arrived at his residence mr joints was dead he had committed suicide on the very night on which we saw that call it vision on board the water lily i viewed the corpse against my will i was not called in evidence had i been i was prepared to swear as was my wife 
that mr joints was the man whom i had seen in a dream that night it was shown at the inquest that he had suffered of late from horrid dreams that he had scarcely dared to sleep i wonder if in that last and most awful of his dreams he had seen my face seen it as i saw his it was afterwards shown from inquiries which were made that mr joints and mr bush tenant of the sylph were beyond all doubt one and the same person on the singular circumstances which caused that discovery to be made i offer no comment end of section twenty six section twenty seven of the seen and the unseen by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sonia twelve the duke a fiction of the future one mrs painter buttonholed a porter can you tell me in which carriage the earl of datchet is travelling who ma'am the earl of datchet or can you point him out to me no ma'am i can't i don't know no such gentleman by your leave ma'am without her leave the porter went off with his load of luggage the lady turned to her daughter how very uncivil the servants are upon this line the young lady said nothing she simply regarded her mother with an expression of placid scorn i wonder if this guard can tell me a guard came hurrying along the platform the lady laid hands of violence on him guard can you tell me which is the earl of datchet the earl of datchet madam is he travelling by this train i saw in fashion that the earl of datchet intended to travel by this morning's tidal train to paris isn't this the tidal train this is the tidal train but i don't know anything about the earl of datchet are you going by this train madam of course i am but guard the lady's hand stole towards her purse i particularly wish to travel in the same compartment as his lordship i am afraid madam that i really don't know anything about his lordship and if you're going you'd better get in they're starting the guard opened the carriage door is this your luggage he signalled to a porter look alive attend to this luggage my dear mother observed miss painter when the heap of wraps had been bundled in are you coming it's most annoying began the lady the guard cut her short now madam if you please almost before mrs painter knew it she was settling herself in the corner of the carriage opposite her daughter before she had settled herself the train was off and before the train was fairly under way she was favouring miss painter with some remarks of a personal nature really edith you are the most trying person i ever encountered you know perfectly well that if i hadn't seen it in the paper i should never have dreamt of crossing to-day and especially by this particular train and yet you won't give me the slightest help or assistance of any kind and now my whole labour's thrown away and my whole purpose spoiled my dear mother what does it matter the young lady not only spoke with her lips but also with her eyes with her organs of vision she drew her mother's attention to the fact that they were not alone in the carriage the elder lady grasped her daughter's meaning but as she glanced at the stranger at the other end she scarcely took that advantage of the hint which she was intended to take and now although you know how much i like to have a carriage to myself and how much i object to travelling with strangers you have allowed that insolent man and i am thankful to think that he lost the five shillings which i quite intended to give him to put us just where it pleased him it's just like you to this observation miss painter answered nothing she looked at her mother and out of the corners of her eyes she peeped at the stranger as she peeped she smiled it was but the faintest shadow of a smile but it was certainly a smile the stranger was a solid-looking young man short and broad he had rather a vacuous expression of countenance his cheeks which were innocent of whiskers were fat and red altogether he did not seem to be the sort of person who was likely to be hurt by a trifle which under the circumstances was perhaps as well none the less he appeared curiously disconcerted 
by a remark which mrs painter all at once addressed to him excuse me sir but are you acquainted with the earl of datchet beg pardon the young gentleman had his feet on the seat in front of him his hat tilted over his eyes and his hands in his trousers pockets and was probably anathematizing with himself for not having gone at once into a smoking carriage instead of endeavouring to secure a whole compartment to himself for the solitary enjoyment in defiance of the company's bylaws of a fragrant weed but on mrs painter's addressing to him her inquiry his feet went off the cushions his head from over his eyes and his hands from out of his pockets with a celerity which was comical i merely inquired if you were acquainted by sight with the person of the earl of datchet when this question was put to him the stranger's demeanour was really singular he half rose from his seat and stared well i'm blowed that's good sir mrs painter regarded him through her glasses with supercilious surprise the stranger transferred his glance from the mother to the daughter as it fell upon the daughter he started again beg pardon i didn't notice did you ask me if i knew datchet miss painter smiled she seemed tickled by the stranger's manner it was not i it was my mother mrs painter did not smile pray edith do not let us trouble this person further i merely made a commonplace inquiry i perceive that i made a mistake if the lady's manner was meant to be crushing and it seemed that it was the stranger remained uncrushed he only stared the more how mrs painter leaned back in her corner my dear edith do not let us trouble this person further but i do know datchet up went the lady's glasses again but if she meant to stare the stranger out of countenance she simply scored another failure when you say datchet are you referring to the earl of datchet dicky datchet yes that's him dicky datchet really you appear to be upon intimate terms with his lordship do you happen to be aware if his lordship is travelling by this train i'll bet a guinea he isn't indeed i understood upon good authority that he intended to do so not he dicky's at boulogne at boulogne is he you seem to have a close acquaintance with his lordship's movements may i ask if you are a friend of his mrs painter was quite incapable of anything more cutting in the way of sarcastic suggestion than her manner conveyed but in spite of it the stranger seemed beautifully unconscious that there was any intention of the kind well it depends on what you call a friend it depends as you say very much indeed upon what you call a friend of course we were kids together kids together youngsters don't you know i'm the duke of staines the you are the for the life of her mrs painter could have got no further the stranger supplied the rest of the sentence the duke of staines he turned to miss painter are you going to boulogne we were thinking of going to paris oh his countenance fell i wish you were going to boulogne why well i'm going to boulogne miss painter smiled outright at this she had more presence of mind than her mother the inference conveyed is very flattering is it i don't know he stared at her stolidly mrs painter found her breath again did i understand you to say really i had no idea you must excuse me did i understand you to say that you were the duke of staines ah, that's me mrs painter regarded him askance she could not make up her mind if he was or was not making fun of her she was not a wise woman she had never before come into personal contact with any member of the british aristocracy could such an extremely vulgar individual as this one appeared to be really be a duke she endeavoured to the best of her small ability to make sure of her ground you don't happen to have a card about you 
oh i always carry a pack when i'm going anywhere but i don't care to play you don't care to what to play unless you feel uncommonly keen miss painter laughed <laughs> you misunderstand my mother she is not asking you for a pack of cards she doesn't as a rule play cards in a train but for a visiting card oh i see exchange pasteboards and that sort of thing dare say i've got one somewhere from a pocket-book which seemed to contain a very miscellaneous collection he produced after long searching a visiting card it was a good deal soiled and the corners were dog's-eared he commented on its defects as he handed it to mrs painter there's a few figures on the back but perhaps you'll excuse them fact is i never seem to want the card i've never got one anyway mrs painter could not have taken that disreputable square of pasteboard with a more dainty grace had it been the most delicate and costly thing in the world when she saw that great name imprinted on its front it was just legible no more she swelled positively and visibly increased in stature with infinite condescension from her silver card case she took a card stiff as buckram and even dazzlingly white allow me to have the honour to present your grace with my card his grace looked at the card painter any relation to billy painter what painter is that putney slogger bantamweight fighting man you know mrs painter drew herself up still more my father was rector of bodgington in essex he married a miss abbeyfield my dear mother and she was a grand niece of the late lord gawler my father was related on his mother's side to admiral piper percussion piper he was called as of course you know because he was so explosive and on his father's side as i have often heard him say the lady was well launched his grace however remorselessly cut her short oh he said he turned to the young lady miss miss painter i certainly am my mother's daughter mrs painter did not seem to be at all offended at having been recently interrupted she came sailing gaily in edith always edith to her friends awfully jolly name edith awfully jolly edith drew herself a little closer into her corner it is very good of you to say so if miss painter's manner all at once was a little glacial mrs painter's continued to be beautifully beaming i cannot tell you how delighted i am at so unexpectedly encountering your grace and under such agreeable circumstances it is such an honour and such a pleasure and you are going to boulogne does your grace purpose staying long at boulogne i oh, don't know awful bore the whole thing fact is i am going to keep an eye on the old woman his grace winked distinctly but the lady was puzzled on whom my wife he winked again the lady was taken aback but she recovered of course i ought not to have forgotten that your grace is married so absurd of me how is the dear duchess eh who oh polly she's going it i hear polly is the dear duchess was polly perkins the pearl of the peeries you know used to be all the go at the halls her great song you know was he tallowed his nose with a candle ever hear it she could sing it she sings it sometimes now but she's got so jolly uppish that sometimes she will and sometimes she won't mrs painter looked slightly startled as well she might be the duke of staines was a young gentleman who was well calculated to startle her elderly ladies respectable elderly ladies read about such things in the papers and delight in them but as they never actually encounter the principal actors in the scandals they have not a favourable opportunity of judging what sort of characters those principal actors must really be to mrs painter the duke of staines was the duke of staines with an accent on thee that a polly whose great song was 
he tallowed his nose with a candle could be the duchess of staines she couldn't realize the thing at all however she was a lady whose mental processes under certain conditions and in a certain sense travelled quickly and is the dear duchess she was still the dear duchess at boulogne yes hang it and dicky datchet's with her too dicky datchet do you mean the earl of datchet that's him dear me how sad i never thought that the earl of datchet was that kind of man what kind of man i always thought that the earl of datchet was a nobleman of the strictest propriety as one of our first nobility ought to be for the sake of the public example it is expected of him what dicky datchet well i'm blowed that's good his grace stared at the lady as though she were some strange animal i'll punch his head for him if he don't take care i can fight if i can't do anything else i'm not going to have him messing about with my wife and i'll let him know it his grace was most affable and quite confidential he told them the most amazing stories about himself and the duchess and the earl of datchet and other persons of similar rank and refinement connected with the halls and otherwise he was a most astonishing young man he shocked miss painter into speechlessness mrs painter would not for the worlds have owned that she was shocked when they were on the boat she made to her daughter this under the circumstances singular remark edith it is quite evident that his grace is greatly struck with you that wretched little cad mother how could you let him go on talking if i had been a man i should have knocked him down there is no doubt that he is a character as a duke of staines can well afford to be edith when i heard that the earl of datchet was going to travel by that train i made up my mind that we would travel with him i have more belief in the power of such beauty as yours than even you have you have money good birth one never knows what may happen instead of an earl chance has thrown a duke into your way edith if you ever become the duchess of staines my wildest dreams at which you have so often laughed will be more than realized aren't you forgetting that there happens to be a duchess she is a person of the worst character my dear i remember the story now quite well a most disreputable story she entrapped him this earl of datchet who is plainly also a person of the loosest morals i am deeply thankful that he wasn't in the train is evidently philandering about with her under such circumstances of course the lady pursed her lips mother for shame edith don't be a fool and you compare such a person as the duke of staines with douglas edith haven't i forbidden you to mention that man's name douglas is at least a gentleman he's a penniless adventurer hush here comes his grace the duke came he addressed miss painter have a liquor i beg your pardon have a liquor just a moistener gin and seltzer's not bad swill if you've got a knack of getting a little bit turned over though i should think on a day like this anyone could look a basin in the face what do you think the young lady did not know what to think this duke was such an extraordinary duke the great middle class is aware that there are members of the british aristocracy who are deficient in brains manners morals and even education but as a matter of fact even in these democratic days individuals of that class seldom come into actual contact even with a baron and when by some wondrous accident they stumble on a duke they expect that duke to be a duke if to all outward seeming he appears to be a cross between a billiard marker and a stable hand they are apt to be surprised when they reached boulogne his grace of staines was so good as to offer the ladies the honour of his escort to their hotel as however they were leaving the boat together some one stopped the pier hello teddy what are you doing here the speaker was a gorgeously attired gentleman who wore as decorations a single eyeglass and a pair of spotless lavender kids 
he was accompanied by a little lady who was remarkable for an enormous quantity of golden hair and a pair of large blue eyes which would have been filled with the light of innocence if their effect had not been marred by a superabundance of complexion his grace of stains surveyed this pair with a glance which was not a glance of affection so it's you is it i ain't been long in finding you you might have been a bit longer teddy if you dropped us a line to let us know that you were coming <sighs> your eyes the pillar of the british constitution used language which was not exactly ducal you'd better mind your p's and q's my lad or i'll give you what for and no mistake the lady interposed she took the eyeglass gentleman by the arm come away dick and for gracious sake don't let's have a row out here the duke seemed struck by the lady's words come away with him is it <laughs> that's good you'll come with me my girl or by mrs painter and her daughter drove away before the conversation became too personal they did without his grace's escort that great nobleman appearing to be spoiling for a fight upon the quay all the passengers and all the loungers looking on mamma observed miss painter as the vehicle began to rattle over the boulogne cobbles i am not going to stay here i am going straight to paris nonsense the elder lady was slightly flushed don't be absurd it was difficult to argue the question then and there at any rate mamma you will please to understand that nothing will induce me to have any intercourse with that wretched man the mother said nothing prudently i don't believe that he is the duke of staines as to that nothing will be easier than to make inquiries he would not be able to carry on that fraud long besides i remember now quite well hearing that the present duke was an eccentric character an eccentric character you call that animal an eccentric character why my dear mother the man's a blackguard an utter blackguard neither more nor less the words were strong but the mother deemed it wiser to let them go unchecked lest peradventure they should be followed by even stronger some hours later mrs painter paid a visit to miss painter in the young lady's own apartment at the hotel edith there can be no doubt that he is the duke of staines it would make no difference to me if he were ten thousand times the duke of staines don't talk nonsense my love the duke of staines is the duke of staines if that is the duke of staines he certainly is with a vengeance his income is nearer three than two hundred thousand pounds and when he came of age he received nearly two millions in ready money mamma the magnitude of the figures seemed momentarily to impress the maiden but you may be quite sure that the ready money is long since spent and the income mortgaged up to the hilt you are entirely mistaken major bagshaw who is staying at the hotel knows all about him there can be no doubt that the duke's manners are peculiar peculiar well aren't they peculiar but it seems that his tastes are low rather than expensive major bagshaw says that financially his position is even better now than when he came into his estate mamma what are you driving at my dear it is common talk that if he chose to apply for a divorce to-morrow he would have ample grounds to go upon if he married again and he of course would marry mrs painter paused the duchess of staines would occupy if she chose one of the proudest positions in england a position which even royalty would be glad to fill she would have everything which the heart of a woman could desire she would have the world at her feet end of section twenty seven section twenty eight of the seen and the unseen by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sonia twelve the duke 
a fiction of the future two you're awfully down upon a fellow i ain't used to it you know no it was after dinner miss painter and the duke of staines were alone together on the veranda of the hotel des bains the duke was smoking he puffed at his cigar he wore an air of injury no i ain't and so i tell you straight i am sorry yes a blooming lot of that i make no doubt might i ask where you acquired that conversational style of which you are so fond it isn't only that you are habitually addicted to the use of slang it is such peculiar slang it always reminds me of shall i say a bus man the duke puffed in silence for a moment do you know that i've never stood from any girl in england to half nor yet a quarter of what i've stood from you and do you know that i have never had to endure from any man in england not to speak of any gentleman one thousandth part of what i have had to endure from you singular isn't it and you're a duke well i'm blowed you're a wonner am i indeed what is a wonner look here what is it you want i'll give you anything you like i've got something in my pocket now from some mysterious inner pocket he took a flat leather case he opened it it contained a necklace of diamonds what do you think of that shiners ain't they i gave five thousand pounds for that little lot she took the case into her hands her countenance betrayed no symptoms of surprise did you i have seen necklaces which seem to me to be quite as good as this which cost much less i am afraid they overcharged you not they i may be a fool about some things i don't need you to tell me that but i'm all there when there's any money on i'm not one to give one and twenty shillings for what's only worth a pound not much i ain't well ain't you going to say even thank you closing the case the lady returned it to the gentleman thank you for the sight what do you mean it's for you i got it on purpose for you it's a little present my dear young man although you are a duke pray don't be absurd do you see that light out at sea i think it must be a steamer i've been watching it for some seconds what's the good of humbugging damn the steamer you know very well i'm gone on you fair gone you know very well that the more you play off the more you drive me on but i ain't going to stand it any longer so i tell you straight she was quiet for some seconds then she said very quietly still looking across the sea what do you mean you know very well what i mean you know i love you you love me then she turned to him a smile played about her lips and the duchess oh the duchess what has it to do with her your ideas are original good-bye she turned right round passing through the open window she entered the sitting-room he followed her don't put me off like that don't upon my word i don't believe you know who i am i'm the duke of staines when he followed her she turned again and smiled it's easy enough for you to laugh but for all that i don't believe that you know what it means to be the duke of staines although you are doesn't it strike you that it is just within the range of possibility that you are insulting me that's all nonsense it isn't as though i was some low cad i see you think that makes a difference of course it does edith he was interrupted by a tapping at the door a waiter entered he had a letter on a salver miss painter took it it was an english letter addressed to her in a masculine hand and marked immediate as her glance fell upon the handwriting she flushed edith resumed the duke when the waiter had disappeared the lady cut him short you continue to insult me the lady's manner all at once had changed 
all traces of a smile had disappeared her eyes flashed fire be so good as to let me pass and this time do not follow me what is the good of all this humbug what is your little game let me pass she moved forward he put his arm about her waist but only for an instant almost as soon as he had put it there he took it away again the young lady swept past him through the window and out on to the veranda possibly one of the reasons which had induced his grace of stains to so speedily remove his too intrusive arm was the fact that mrs painter had entered the room the lady came in very quietly miss painter's back had been turned to the door so that although the mother's entrance had been sufficiently obvious to the gentleman it had been unnoticed by her daughter when the younger lady had gone the elder lady and the duke remained face to face the ball of conversation was opened by the lady is it possible that your grace was offering insult to my child his grace had his hands in his trousers pockets he seemed huffed and jerked his elbow towards the leather case which lay upon the table i don't know what you call insult i was offering her that and pray what may that be it's a present i got for her i didn't mean it for an insult it cost me a cool five thousand i do know that five thousand pounds your grace the lady took the case into her hands she opened it diamonds and you have given them to edith what prodigal generosity i don't know about given them because she wouldn't take em she wouldn't take them jiggered if she would she treated them as though they were bits of glass and i was a barber's clerk the lady reflected possibly she misconstrued the motives which actuated you in offering her so costly a gift i don't see how she could because i told her i offered it because i loved her because you loved her your grace i presume you mean in a platonic sense outside the window was miss painter when she first left the room she had passed to the end of the veranda the precious letter marked immediate held tightly in her hand she opened it and read it in the dim light out there it was short and pithy and sweet my darling i have been offered a birth worth eight hundred a year such a stroke of luck it isn't much but there will be more to follow and it's enough for a start i vote we make a match of it at once you said you would i'm coming over by friday's boat mind you meet me at the quay douglas that was all the letter friday's boat that's tomorrow douglas there was a great tenderness in her voice as she emphasized the name with the letter pressed against her bosom she strolled back along the balcony the sound of voices reached her she had approached the open window of her mother's private sitting-room the duke was speaking i don't know about platonic sense i ain't good at that kind of thing i know i'm fair gone on her there was a pause then her mother spoke i can only hope that i misunderstand your grace i don't know why you should i tell you i love the girl your grace and the duchess oh blow the duchess if it comes to that i'll marry the girl does your grace then propose to commit bigamy bigamy <laughs> not me i'll get a divorce another pause miss painter without could fancy her mother's smile of bland maternal love of course if you were free that would be another matter and if a little bird tells the truth you should have no difficulty in obtaining your freedom then a little bird just lies polly's as steep as they make em she's not to be caught with chaff she knows what it means to be duchess of stains trust her she don't mean to get lost for nothing carry on to any amount she will but just so far and not a small bit farther i've had detectives on her track for the last six months watching her night and day but they tell me it's no good up to now still another pause 
the young lady without could hear the duke pacing up and down the room but i'll corner her at last see if i don't then i'll marry edith if she'll have me upon my word i ain't so sure that she will i never saw such a wonner she treats me as though i was a dirty bagman i'll give her anything anything i'll make her the greatest lady in england i'll settle on her twenty thousand pounds a year twenty thousand i'll settle on her anything she likes while the distinguished nobleman within gave free rein to his chivalrous sentiments the young lady without pressed the precious letter closer to her bosom her mother spoke softly almost purringly you see your grace places me in rather a difficult position having declared your affection for my daughter it is necessary that i should protect her by every means in my power would your grace object to giving me some sort of memorandum which would embody in some form the sentiments which you have just now uttered and which do you so much honour i mean business i tell you straight come along to my room and i'll give you a written promise of marriage right off the reel hanged if i won't mrs painter went along with him miss painter heard the door shut after them as she heard it she knew that she stood within measurable distance of being one of the greatest women in england a woman who if she chose might rule society she knew too that physically and intellectually she was just a woman to play the part of social queen that she would be a ruler who would have no rivals she knew that she had but to stretch out her hand for all the gifts of all the gods to fall into her open palm yet she only pressed that letter closer to her breast several sitting-rooms opened out on to that veranda the french windows of the room adjoining were thrown right back as she stood there thinking of all that grand future to which she possessed the open sesame she was conscious that into that adjoining room had come two persons a man and a woman the man spoke is everything ready the woman answered everything the train leaves at ten minutes to two we can catch the five minutes to nine in paris and we shall be in nice by a few minutes past six on saturday afternoon Dicky you will be true to me isn't it rather late in the day to ask me such a question don't you know i will but swear you will i swear it for the hundredth time you will marry me afterwards i will upon my honour the woman's voice was low and earnest even painfully in earnest the man's tone was light and flippant the woman drew a long deep breath miss painter heard her as she stood without pressing the letter closer and closer to her breast when i think of how i nearly jumped out of my skin for joy when i became the duchess of staines it seems impossible that after all it should have come to this exchange is no robbery you're going to be a countess for a change don't you think it sounds well enough countess of datchet it's all very well for you to laugh but you don't know what it means to me you think what he thought because i was a music-hall singer a serial comic the pearl of the peeries he thought that i was anybody's money but i wasn't and so he found and so you'll find dicky if you don't marry me directly you can i'll murder you i swear i will there's not time enough for tragedy polly put it off until we're in the train do you think those those brutes will follow us if you mean the detectives i take it for granted that one if not two of them will be our fellow travellers to the sunny south they will enjoy the trip at teddy's expense there was silence the woman was pacing to and fro when she spoke again it was in tones of the intensest bitterness if i were to tell you what i stood from that man you wouldn't wonder at what i'm doing now he's treated me worse than a dog from the moment he married me and i was such a fool that i thought that if i was once the duchess of staines everything would be all right he made no settlement on me as for money i haven't had it he told me that if i sent any of my bills to him he'd thrash me within an inch of my life and he'd do it too especially if he had been drinking he's never introduced me to a respectable woman he had detectives to watch me 
i know polly i've heard some of it before and i'll hear the rest when we're in the train look here dick datchet i've been an honest woman up till now and although i'm going to run away with you i mean to be an honest woman still you put it down in black and white that you promise to marry me the very first moment you can what would be the good of that such a promise wouldn't be valid i can't promise to marry a woman who's married already besides don't you love me enough to trust me come here polly although she could not actually see that it was so miss painter knew that the earl of datchet had taken the duchess of staines into his arms don't you love me yes there was the sound of a kiss you know that i do then you may trust me to see you through it all the woman drew another long deep breath but she said nothing and you better go and get ready no said miss painter as she passed through the window i wouldn't if i were you the earl of datchet was leaning against the table the duchess's waist was encircled by his arm they stared at the intruder in not unjustifiable surprise miss painter addressed herself to the duchess i wouldn't go and get ready if i were you what do you mean the duchess replied why my dear child because in real knowledge of this wicked world i believe you're nothing but a child you're only biting off your nose to spite your face you're jumping out of the frying pan into the fire this gentleman has not the slightest real intention of marriage have you this frankly put inquiry seemed somewhat to startle the earl really i i have not the pleasure of knowing me but i know you very well both by sight and reputation i assure you my dear duchess that you would be a very foolish woman to trust yourself in the least degree to him the earl of datchet roused himself to the best of his ability may i ask miss painter i believe you are miss painter what business this is of yours it is the business of every honest woman to use the duchess's very proper phrase to save other honest women from being ruined and tricked by gentlemen don't you think it is there were voices without here is the duke just when he is wanted that distinguished nobleman appeared outside the window mrs painter was with him your grace prepare to be shocked to receive a crushing blow you have been deceived betrayed by a friend your own friend proposed to elope with your wife by the train which leaves at ten minutes to two for paris only i appeared upon the scene in the very nick of time the duke lumbered into the room what the devil he began then he stopped he glared at the earl the earl beamed at him edith said mrs painter going to her daughter who had her arm about the duchess what is the meaning of your peculiar behaviour come into the other room come duchess into the other room when they were in the other room mrs painter repeated her inquiry now edith perhaps you will explain i don't know that there is anything to explain unless duchess what do you think i am going to be married the mother gasped you are going to be married edith when perhaps next week to to whom to douglas end of section twenty eight end of the seen and the unseen by richard marsh